Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to New Beginning Celebration, for this is an amazing day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it, and I will get this microphone to acting like it wants to behave itself before we move on. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. Somebody out there has pressed play to hear something that they are in need of this afternoon or this morning or whenever you're watching this, and uh, I'm delighted to be a partaker with the Lord and helping you solve whatever problems you may have, um, uh, that you may be seeking salvation in Jesus Christ. If you're hurting today, maybe this will be the word that brings you to a place of healing. If you're afraid today, maybe this will be the word that will bring you comfort and joy, something to feed your spirit, to feed your soul, to renew your mind and regulate your life. I tell you, um, don't think just because I'm a pastor that it's it's easier for me. It's it's actually probably even harder. Um, but, you know, as long as I can stay in the fight, I'll do all I can to help anyone that wants to come under the sound of my voice. So this is an amazing day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Again, we're New Beginning Celebration. I'm Pastor Damon, or I'm Damon, pastor here at New Beginning Celebration. Uh, my mom didn't name me Pastor Damon. She named me Damon. And... <laughs> I just happened to walk in the office of pastor by the calling of the Lord. It wasn't my choosing. You better believe for about 20 years I ran as hard as I could. And, uh, hey, how, how about, you know, you, you, you realize at some point you can't outrun the arm of the Lord. It is long and it reaches around the universe. And when he has called you to something, he's going to make certain you get to it. You can go willingly or you can go kicking and screaming. There are many that are serving in the capacity of what God called them in, in prison or, or, or in the wilderness somewhere because they decided not to, to just jump on board when God called them. But nevertheless, they're being used. And at some point in life, when our face is down to the floor, we have to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will go. So here we are. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I hope that your time is well spent. Uh, you can't get any thing back when a second ticks off the clock, but you can hopefully enjoy what you hear today. And if, it, if it's something that stings a little bit, take it in. Let it reprove your life. Let it be a rebuke and some discipline. Sometimes we just need that. But it's also instruction for righteousness. And this is what we're told in the book of Timothy about the word of God. If everybody will, please turn with me to Psalm 91 if you have your Bibles. Psalm 91. We're going to read through it a little bit again today, as we did last week. We're continuing a series today called Psalm 91, God's Got You. You know, God's got you. We, we got you covered. God's got you covered. Psalm 91, God, God's, apostrophe S, got you covered. If you're all there, thank you. Say bologna sandwiches. Bologna sandwich. All right, that's what I'm talking about. I'm hungry now. <laughs> but I'm going to eat this word first because that supersedes everything. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, in my God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste in noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Listen to what God has to say in response to that. He's saying that to us who will do all of what we just read. 
Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. There ain't no sometimes, maybe, yes, maybe, no. I will answer him. We don't have a dead God. Okay, let me finish the scripture reading because I'm getting ready to get on to another sermon. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Father, we thank you today for the power of your word and the presence of your word. Therefore, Father, we thank you for your power and for your presence being with us. We honor you and we lift you up on high because you are the most high God. And we thank you for being not a deadbeat dad, but a faithful father who loves us and nurtures us into who you want us to be. Thank you for caring for us, providing all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Today we have water to drink and to bathe in and to to water the plants and animals um, and to keep life moving on earth. Today, Father, we have heat and cool. We have shelter from the storm. We have travel. We have work and income. And, Father, we thank you that you are an increasing God that continues to increase those things that pertain to us. Thank you for giving us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, Father, we come to sit at the feet of Jesus, to humble ourselves, to listen to your word, to listen to your truth that will make us free. And we depend on your power, your word, to transform or even transfigure our lives to be conformed more into the image of your dear son, Jesus Christ. Now, Father, help us to decrease that you may increase and fill us with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and all spiritual understanding that we may walk fully pleasing unto the Lord and worthy of your calling. Uh, we are uh, but that mere flesh, but with your power, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so we thank you, Father, for filling us with your spirit, for continuing to pour your word into us and to fill us with your word. <clears throat> Therefore, we can walk in dunamis. We can walk in power. Father, we can we can, uh, we can enforce exousia. We can enforce that power, that judiciary power, Father, that, that keeps the enemy out of our camp. And we retain the victory over him as we exercise the victory that Christ has won for us. We thank you, Father. We thank you for loving us. And we love you back. And we pray this prayer to you today. Amen. Continuing again in Psalm 91, God's got you covered. You know, this this psalm right here, as we get on down into it, I got, I, it, I'm, I'm fighting, y'all can tell, I'm, I'm fighting the resistance to go like down to the end and just pluck out all those wonderful promises that God gave us there because there's so much preaching and teaching that is contrary to some of the things that God himself said there. It's in quotations, those are, that's his words. And when we get there, I just don't throw eggs at me. If you if you throw them, you know, I hope I can catch them and put them in the frying pan and eat them. Because I sometimes I get a little bit hungry. I need an egg every now and then. Uh, just just open your heart and your mind and receive what the word says, not what tradition says, not what Christian ease says, not what mom and them told you way back when. I know grandma rocked you on her knee and she said things that, and that what she won't show you the pages of the Bible all the time. Some things were just passed on by word of mouth that wasn't the word. That many of us have cried tears thinking, God, I believe the Bible had said this all my life. <coughs> <coughs> and come to find out plainly right in front of our noses. And sometimes we were still believing the traditional thing that was said while reading what it actually said right in front of us. That just goes to show you how well a person can be deceived into believing something so long that it becomes rooted and grounded or cemented in their minds that when you actually literally see it right there on the paper, you go, oh, no, no, that ain't, that ain't true. I'm going to get into this word, but I just watched some videos this weekend from the folks down there in South Carolina, oh yeah, Joe Biden's doing a great, great, great job with the economy. There's a video coming on that one real soon. 
Because if you can't tell the difference in the stretching of your money today versus five years ago, you just might be a candidate for some psychological help. No, 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 no. You're a candidate to be locked in a room with me with this body. I, I, I would love that job. You don't even have to pay for it. I'll get my pay. Don't worry about it. The Lord will serve me well. You just might be a candidate to be locked up in a room with a, a nutty Bible teacher. And trust me, like when I study, most of the time I go to like 4, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. Every time the sun's been coming up and I go to bed and then get up and come in here and teach the word, you ain't going to outlast me. I've been built for that. <laughs> just want to warn you, if you if I find you, you're coming to get locked up in here with me. We're going to have armed guards outside. All right, here we go. <laughs> It'll be fun for me. I don't know about you. Listen to what the Bible says. So continuing on and coming to know and understand God's promise of military-like protection, I want to encourage everyone with the words of our awesome God. He says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 through 9, I'm going to read that because he gave Joshua some powerful stuff. Joshua was a military leader. Joshua was one of those two witnesses that came back and said, yes, we can conquer the land. The others were crying, ooh, they're like giants to us. But Joshua and Caleb came back and said, oh, we can take them. We've got this. And that's the kind of boldness we need in the body of Christ to believe. Because, listen, that's the only way you're going to believe God's got you covered. you got to believe in your heart. The same God that's got you covered is the God that's going to per and permit you and empower you to conquer the territory. So Joshua was that military leader. He was a little different than Moses. Here's the beautiful part of it. Those two played a significant role to be just like Christ or types of Christ. Moses delivered them out. And then Joshua saved them into the new kingdom. See, Moses won't going to be able to do both of them. I know we read the story and how, you know, Moses disobeyed God and, 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 and God, you know, gave him some discipline for it. And he wasn't going to lead the children over the Jordan. He wasn't going to lead the children of Israel over the Jordan, over the river and into the promised land. But I submit to tell you, Moses did get into the promised land. Who was that Jesus was talking to on the Mount of Transfiguration? He just wasn't going to be the one to lead the children into the promised land. Okay, okay. Across the river. But he transfigured onto the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah talking to Jesus. So did he get in there? All right, all right. Maybe not physically right at that time. All right. Everybody, let's, uh, let's understand the scripture because we don't want to beat up Brother Mo. Brother Moe's was like us. He frustrated with that crowd of folks. Lord talking to him. I have the same thing going on at my job during the week. God talk to me, but I get angry and I do something different. Oh, God, <laughs> he hit that rock twice, and God said, all right, there, there you go. See, you, you just didn't follow what I told you, so you won't be the one. But on the flip side of it spiritually, Moses wasn't supposed to do both because there was only one coming that would do both, deliver you out and save you in. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's like David was a king and a prophet. Some people don't understand David's prophecies. But he pro pro prophesied about the coming of the Lord oftentimes. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That wasn't first written in Matthew. That was first written by the psalmist named David. And that whole chapter is everything Jesus said after he said that on the cross. Matthew only recorded seven things. Or there's only seven things recorded that Jesus said in the New Testament on while he was hanging on the cross. But that was a dissertate. If you read, he's talking about seeing his bones. They stare back at him and all the things that because he had had his flesh ripped off of him. David prophesied that whole thing. But he couldn't be king, priest, and prophet because there was only one coming to be king, priest, and prophet. There's only one to become to come that will be the deliverer and the savior. All right, so that's a little background on Joshua. But Joshua was a military leader, a warrior, and a man, a mighty man of God who trusted him well. So I'm going to read this, Joshua 1. Uh, verses 1 through 9. After death, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord came to pass. It came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Yeah. Wow. Moses, my servant is dead, the Lord has said. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, 
to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. And make no mistake about it, that is to the children of Israel. Not what the made-up word Palestinian, which because that's just something that came about later on in case anybody's wondering. That belongs to the children of Israel. Write me a letter, I'll enjoy it. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. I don't think everybody understands and comprehend how much land really belongs to the children of Israel. And to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. I don't think everybody realizes how much territory in the Middle East that God gave to the children of Israel. But I tell you what, the one way you'll see it with a smile on your face is to receive Christ as your Savior. Because there's a time coming, it's all going to be revealed. Or you'll see it not smiling. When you see Christ, you're going to see the, 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 the results of what he's talking about here. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Man, how many times are we going to hear that? Watch, watch. Be encouraged. That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. And do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Listen, listen, listen. The word prospers. It adds. It moves forward. It advances in life. It continues. It, it, it builds the pathway of our lives from day to day to day to day. When we forsake the word of God and don't give attendance to the word of God, our lives are in peril. We're not functioning at full capacity as God has designed us to be. Why? Well, because we were created by him saying, let us create. He said something. So we have to return to that and abide on that and dwell in that which has created us. You take a flower out of the dirt, it what? Put it back in the dirt before it dies, it what? Comes right back, doesn't it? It revives. That's just like our life. When we don't stay in the word, we're like a flower plucked up out of the dirt. And we start to wither. And we realize the, the difference is the flower can't move and put itself back in the dirt, but we can. So we got to get back to that life source that gave us life in the first place. The Bible is referred to sometimes as the water. Let water, let it stop raining. <laughs> Not just the plants and animals die. Guess who else died? I ain't no vampire. I won't be drinking blood. I hate to tell you. Okay, let's go. Look. Verse 8 says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Again, he reiterates that. But you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do. That's the part we, we drop off from sometimes. We'll meditate on the word sometimes. I don't know about day and night, but it means just constantly. We need to be speaking the word all the time. He just says, let it not depart out of your mouth. That means always let your mouth be filled with the word of God. And meditate on it day and night. That means like chewing like a cow, chewing the cud when you study that word in the Hebrew. Anybody ever watch a cow out in the field? They can just stand there. As long as you can sit there, you'll see him chew. You might as well go ahead and plan to be there for a while, pack a lunch, because he'll just sit there. I'm like, what? I haven't seen him dunk his head down in the last hour and a half and get anything. What is he doing? He must be chewing his tongue. That's what my uncle used to tell me. Hit you in his tongue, like he don't know. He just. But that's what that's what that word means. That means continuously, continuously. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you, then you will have good success. Then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. How many people have heard me talk about this being your toolbox? Want to fix your life? God gave you tools. 
But I said, well, I know the Lord is going to. Well, as long as you know the Lord is going to, guess what going to always has been doing? Going to. It never has done it. It's going to. It's going to. Going to is always out there. No, the Lord has done it, and he gave us now the tools to go ahead and take your wrench, your screwdrivers, and your pliers, and your wire cutters, and let's get to work on our life. And that's exactly what he just told Joshua here. Let me go ahead and read verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. we got to believe that that is true for us because now the Holy Spirit dwells inside of every believer. And that same, I will never leave you nor forsake you, was translated into the New Testament and told us in the New Testament, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said himself, he says, I have you in the palm of my hand and no man can pluck you out. No one can pluck you out of my hand. He didn't just say no man. No man. He said, no one. He said, my father who is greater than I have you in his hand and no one can pluck you out of his hand. So we're double covered right there. The Bible talks several times about, and we're going to get into that, about Jesus making intercession for us. He's our advocate in 1 John chapter 2. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who continues to make intercession for us. We're told in the middle of the book of Romans, somewhere around about chapter 8, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit that intercedes for us when we don't even know what we know how to pray for. He prays for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, that cannot even be uttered. Let me help you understand that is not speaking in tongues for those of you who think that that's what that means. It said it can't be uttered. I don't care what language you're speaking <laughs> He is speaking to the Father on our behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. <laughs> Somebody was, I heard people for years say, well, that means, that, see, there it is right there speaking in tongues. I said, really? I see that it said it cannot even be spoken by you. Stop twisting the word of God and understand there are some things God has the power to do that he don't let us in on doing. Amen. Now, all of a sudden, it starts to become humanism. And there is a work we have to do. But the Holy Spirit is banging out intercession for us all the time before the Lord, before the Father. <sighs> and you will get a dab of that intercession if you will continue to speak the word in your life. Because the Holy Spirit is here to use the word as the cleansing agent for our life. So he's interceding for us continuously. All right, all right, all right. So we got that. Be courageous, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. So he said, be of good courage. And then re reinforcement, do not be afraid or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Awesome. Awesome. We have that confidence. Okay, here we go. Isaiah 44 and 8, he commands this. He commands us and reminds us, do not fear or fear, do not be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Sometimes we create other gods. Sometimes our other God can be our spouse. Sometimes our other God can be our jobs, our careers. Sometimes our other job can be our hobby. I know what it's like, you know, being that you know, when I was involved deeply in my, my music career, teaching and adjudicating and performing, and it became so much more important than everything else. I put that before God. I put that before even my family at times. And, you know, it just, you know, and, and for the sake of, again, here comes one of those, uh, let's clear up the, the, the myth and the lies and the deceptions. I've got to work this hard for my family. I've, I'm doing this. I'm sacrificing myself for. And then it's like, oh, you're, you're going to be a freshman in college. But you were just six years old yesterday. <laughs> Where'd it go? Then we're going to wonder, well, when they come home, where did you get that from? Uh, that's not what we believe in this house. Ha, ha, ha. 
See, indeed, there is no other rock. Have we taken a little bit more extra time to pull back up? You know, tomorrow's coming. That can be done tomorrow. Pull back and invest ourselves. And husbands, we got to invest ourselves in our wives. The Bible says, sanctify her by the washing of the water, of the word. Husbands, you sanctify your wife. That's not my job, is what the Lord laid you. Now, it's, it's his job overall because we're going to use the word to do it. See, that's the beauty of it. So he is doing it, but he's doing it through the agent of the Holy Spirit working through us. I tell all the time, that's my responsibility. Get a little, you know, get a little conversation and get gets a little tight. I turn around and I hate to be rough, but I go, that's my responsibility. So that's why I'm telling you. And you got the right one because I'm built better than the Titanic, baby. I'm not going down. Because the spirit of the Lord is with me. That's my responsibility to make sure when you walk out of this house, you are equipped. If I drop dead right now, you are equipped. When you walk out into public, you're going to you're gonna shine like the brightness of the glory of God. That's my responsibility, and I take it serious. Don't think enough men in the world take it serious. Just let their wives, you know, dictate and, and, and take charge and... and, and I heard a man last night, a, politi a, a, a politician in our in our area, that talked about the women, sh the, you know, having strong Republican women and shouldering the load and all that. And I wanted to go up there and grab that microphone and say, "Time out!" But that's not what's supposed to be happening. Why are they pulling up to shoulder the load? What are we doing? They weren't built for that. I am reminded in the Bible, right at the beginning, God said, "I will make a." helper suitable for him. Now, they energize us and give us, they're the catalyst, they're the fuel that helps us rocket to the top, but she's supposed to fuel us while we go ahead on and, and, and stand guard and take on the responsibility of making sure things are right in the earth. All right, I'm going to get off of that. <laughs> I can see people hitting the stop button now. Don't hit the stop button. That is the truth, man. Let, we gotta get, we gotta get up, man. We gotta, and I know I'm not picking because I know sometimes to make ends meet it does take a little extra time. I'm talking about those guys who just never, never, when they come home and sit down, they're still giving attention to everything else. Just, it just never leaves. All right, let's keep going. You don't that that one was free too. Then how about Isaiah 54 and four, where he admonishes. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. Okay, okay. Wow. Whew. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. So obviously he's talking to a, a lady at this point. You will not Remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. But listen, listen, listen. And he's talking to the children of Israel because, you know, really, as the children, we are the bride also of the Lord of Christ. But listen, listen. I love it when God says you will not be put to shame. Why not stand up and speak? You know why? Because Satan's already talking to us. And you know if you say something, you're going to look foolish. You better not say that. You're going to embarrass yourself. Why you for Jesus when you know everybody don't believe in him anyway. Hmm. You know you might lose your job. Come on, everybody keep keep going with the list. What is your family going to think about you? You're going to be a weirdo. A weirdo anyway. So it doesn't bother me. I'm just walking right in the, in the middle of who I'm supposed to be, a weirdo. Because we are strangers and pilgrims. We're not going to be, the world is not going to be friends of ours because of who we are. So we're already weirdos. Check. And see, we stop speaking so much now until they think they can go ahead on and silence us now for real. I love my big mouth. I love it. I love the book, and I don't know. I, I don't know what it will take for everyone. I know it took me going through some pretty shocking events in my life 
some pretty devastating events. Some induced by myself, some induced by outside circumstances. But through it all, it fired me and chiseled me and became the fortified steel in my soul to be able to do that and to be a, a leader amongst people and to say things that somebody, and I just, I want everybody to grab that boldness because in Christ there is no fear. God's got you covered. I don't care what the big bad wolf in Washington says. You know, we used to say, who's afraid of the big bad wolf, the big bad wolf, the big bad wolf. Y'all remember the song? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? You know. And now all of a sudden we become adults. We have Christ. The Bible says we have the authority and we have power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt us. Yet this is the time when we start going to be a recluse. So we're starting to back away and backpedal out of the, you know, and abort the run of advancing the kingdom of God forward. And now our country's being taken over by people who are godly. When it wasn't established from that premise. Churches are shutting down. They're preaching lollipop sermons that don't mean a hill of beans. Good old feel good 17 minute sermons that when you walk out, all you got was a couple of scriptures read to you. Now let us pray. I'm here to teach us how to grow up. I'm still growing up too. And every time I read whatever the Lord has given me to teach, something else is still happening in me. Like right at this moment, this script, this, this sermon here has been it's five years old. I taught it one time before. It wasn't on video. So, you know, I go back through some of them so we can go ahead and, and everybody can have an opportunity to see and to hear them. And I still let the Lord lead me as to what to teach. Sometimes it's directed towards the temperature of the community and of the individuals that are here, the ebb and flow, the individuals that come and the individuals that leave. That's okay because I know they're still click and play. Some right now in South Korea, as far as South Korea, some as far as Boston, Massachusetts, some in Texas, and some all over North Carolina. I know I know some of them who have written me back and said, yeah, man, I, I, I'm still watching your, your video. I go, wow. So, man, don't you ever forgot? No, one of those views is mine. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Because we do get a lot of out-of-towners that come through. Man, here last week was from High Point, him and his friend. One other day was from, I think he, I think he lives in, in, in Raleigh. I don't know where Tom's from. He was from he's from everywhere. Okay, so, so, and in the New Testament, he declares through the Apostle Paul, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, he says a spirit of fear because there's several different fears. He didn't say the spirit of fear. There's not just one spirit of fear. Whatever can make you afraid d doesn't bother me, but whatever bothers me won't bother you. You know, there's different. There's some people that's afraid of white bread. <laughs> Y'all watch them show. Come on now. Everybody stop acting like all you watch is Jesus TV. Y'all stop watching, y'all stop acting like all y'all watch is Jesus.com. Y'all know y'all saw Mari Povich or somebody way back in the day. I remember in the early 90s, and he had people come on stage that was afraid of certain things. And somebody brought a loaf of white bread out there. That lady liked to tow the roof off that place getting out of there. Boom, chairs were falling there. I said, good God, she done broke three ankles, and she ain't got but two. What? <laughs> Some people are afraid of snakes. Some people are to pick a snake up. <clears throat> Some people are afraid of spiders. Some others will walk up and let the spider walk right up on their finger. Some people are afraid of bugs. Some people eat bugs. Y'all remember when that show Survivor first came out? First couple of episodes was all right. I was like, ooh, man, that's like survival of the fittest, you know. I was a Boy Scout. I can do this. Then it just started getting ridiculous. I was like, I can't watch that anymore. Like episode three, I was done. I can't remember what year that was, 1998, 97, uh, you know, 2000, whatever. God has not given us the spirit of fear. But what has he given us? He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. We were just talking about that, weren't we? Why hold back? Somebody's life is hanging in the balance. 
even if they're even if they're trying to oppose, we're to be apt to teach the word when they stand in opposition. Because the Bible says, and who knows that God may may come and present them repentance to save them from the terror that is to come. I don't argue the Bible. The Bible it didn't tell you to argue. It told you to understand what it says so you can teach somebody something. Just perhaps that God will grant them repentance and pull them away from the snare of the devil. So sometimes when we when somebody want to argue with us about what the what the word says, we just turn around and say, well, you know, I just don't argue the Bible. You just might have been that vessel God was trying to use to get that person saved. But you got afraid of getting into an argument. But I also believe, as I said earlier, tradition and Christianese. All right, all right. Y'all know, y'all, we've already studied those verses in here, right? We've already studied them at our exploration through the scripture. I was like, yeah, what are you, what are you talking about arguing the Bible? We're not arguing the Bible. We're going to use the Bible to take, to take somebody's life and reveal the truth to them so that they can be made free. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Don't be afraid to do it because God's got you covered. It is passages like these, plus hundreds more throughout the Bible, that can bring us security, peace, and comfort as we stare in the face of the enemy. Anybody seen that when two boxers are getting ready to fight and they're, you know, they're doing their promotional? They get nose to nose sometimes, don't they? Every now and then they bump chest, bump heads. Sometimes they'll back off a little bit and want to jab in and get a quick punch and they come in and break them up. It's all for promotional purposes. Now, sometimes that backfire and they get in the ring against that person they took that cheap shot at and they get <laughs> I remember what you did to me on national television. I didn't appreciate that. I know it was for promotional purposes, but I took that serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So we got we to gotta face our enemy head on as we stare him in the face. He doesn't want us to look him in the face. He wants us to do this. All right. I know, I know, I know we've all been in situations where it was a supervisor. Maybe even one of our parents that were acting bully-like. Our parents usually want us to look at them. That was actually teaching us something. When they're having a chastise and say, look at me. Look at me. That was actually teaching us how to be men and women right then. But then the enemy always makes us feel like we're not strong enough to stand and eyeball someone who's in opposition of us face to face. Care what kind of authority they have. Doesn't matter. You put your pants on one leg at a time, just like I do. If you don't cut your hair, you're going to look like a werewolf, just like I would. Well, like I used to would. <laughs> i just go ahead and take care of all that problem right now. In fact, he reminded us in Psalm 23 that he had prepared a table before us in the very presence of our enemies. In simpler words, he has honored us with salvation and blessing and his enemy defeating word. Because the word of God defeats the enemy. Who was that hanging on the cross? The word of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who was that hanging on the cross? The word of God. What did he do? He defeated the enemy. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Revelation 19 and 13 says that his name is called the word of God. So when you ask people, when you ask the Father in his name, you better be asking in the word of God. That's the proper way to pray. I don't care what anybody says. Because when we pray according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if he hears us, we know that we have the confidence in getting that which we have asked in 1 John. So he, we have been given also his enemy defeating word. We are not to debate with the enemy. It's not, it's not about debating. And sometimes we'll get in our flesh, even with somebody that the enemy is using, and we get into this debate in fleshly conversation. Opinions being tossed around everywhere, and ideologies and philosophies and stupid things. No, nope, just go ahead and pack it right back to the word of God. Sometimes it takes me a couple of seconds, and I spewed out a couple of things, and I just, uh, 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 u
wait a minute, <laughs> rewind. The Bible says, then they come back, but the Bible says, and after you do that a few times, sometimes they'll shut up and walk away, feel like they need a gun and one bullet, or they may say, let me hear more. I've won a couple over, even at the job I work at, by going, but the Bible says, but the Bible says, so, but you, but here's the problem. We may not know what the Bible says. Joshua already said to us today in Joshua 1 and 8, never let it depart from your mouth. Don't, 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 don't let it be ever not in your mouth. And what? Meditate in it day and night. And then be that living epistle as Paul calls us. Be careful to do all that is written therein. Because you may be the only Bible some people are going to read. I may be the only Bible some people are going to read. Be careful to do all that is written therein. That's not just for us. It is primarily, first and foremost, for us. Because, you know, just like on the airplane, they tell you if the cabin should lose pressure, the mask is going to drop down. Where did they tell you to put the mask first? Then put it on your child. You put it on your child and then you go out, who going to save the kid? Especially a two-year-old who don't know that they need to keep that thing up against their face. A one-year-old, an infant? No. And everybody, let's work out together. But home base has got to be taken care of first. All right, all right, all right, all right. We got to know the word. We got to be careful to do all that is written therein so that our lives will be strengthened and reveal the glory of God. Then as we walk and live before others, they're either going to want some of what we have or want to destroy us. Either way, we are blessed for being persecuted for righteousness sake. I'm okay with that. All right, here we go. Here we go. Do not be afraid, though. God's got you covered. We are to stand in authority. I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And now he says, I give you authority. I give you, I now give you exousia. No, she said, I give you dunamis. To trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the dunamis of the enemy. Or I give you exousia to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the dunamis of the enemy. So now we've been endued with dunamis when we see Acts chapter 1. Let me, let me slow down my thoughts here. Acts chapter 1, we've been filled with dunamis. Exousia is a different word for power because if you got the King James Version, it says, I've given you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That's in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke, Luke 10, 18 and 19. Well, you say, well, we've been filled with dunamis. According to the book of Acts, chapter 1, when Jesus says, now I, you are endued with power from on high. You are endued with power. I send you out, you're a dude. Okay? All right, all right, sorry. So, so we've been endued with dunamis, power. Enemy defeating power. And then the Bible comes over here in Luke and says that Satan has dunamis. Well, he got some dunamis. I mean, he stole the lease on the earth from Adam and Eve right there in the garden. He got a little juice. He got a little juice. Here's the beautiful part of it. Exousia is delegated authority over his power. So I've given you exousia to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the dunamis of the enemy. He's got dunamis and you got dunamis. But now I empower you with the authority with your dunamis, the dunamis I have filled you with, to have authority over his dunamis. Okay, okay, okay. The sheriff shows up at your house. He got a gun, you got a gun. Both of you got some power. But who has exousia? He wears a gold star on his chest that says, I have delegated authority. Governor Cooper got some power. Our sheriff got some power. He understands his power over this county. So he makes a phone call to 
our, our dunamis makes a phone call to the other dunamis because he's got exousia over that dunamis when it comes to Craven County. So we're not shutting down any churches here during COVID. Governor Cooper couldn't do nothing but hang up the phone and say, well, just lost another one. Because he doesn't have exousia over our sheriff, over the county, over the laws of the county. Most people don't even know that. You think this, the governor rules and super rules over everything and say, no, 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 no. Even the sheriff, he is not a little chump. These sheriffs have authority and power over the governor when it comes to what happens in this county. The FBI can come down here kicking the doors in if they want to. They've got somebody to answer to. We just think the sheriff is another little gun toter. <laughs> y'all better read your, y'all better read the, 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 uh, the Constitution of the state. You better read the laws of the state and understand who do you call first. I'm sorry, we were in the city limits last night at an event downtown. In the city limits of this city. I looked around, I didn't see New Bern City police officers. You know who I saw standing around that arena? Sheriff deputies. In most cities, it's not like that. Sheriffs take care of stuff outside the city limits. City cops take care of city police, take care of stuff inside the city limits. Last night, I saw gold stars all over the room. Right? Yeah. Because he understands his authority. So when he became sheriff, he made a pact with them and said, now, we're going to work together. And they'll run you down inside the city limits just as much as they will out there in the woods between here and Vanceboro. And I'm glad for it. Man, do I feel good. Some of us live right on a little road. There's a little road right, right in between. A couple of folks sitting here live on the other side of that road. We live on the other side of that road called Gracie Farm Road. Down at the end is Troublesville. <laughs> a few hundred yards from my house. When he became sure. The broom was sweeping down there all the time. I said, get him, get him. Because <laughs> I don't want to have to wake up and put somebody in a box. I mean, I don't want to have to do that, but I will. I, I, I want to spare, you know, I know I have to spend at least one night in jail for doing it. But if you, I, I'd rather him take care of that because if they come in my place. Well, I don't know, his arm was over here when I finished. There's some, the neighbor's dog must have run in and got his arm. All right, I know y'all was like, oh, that's a pastor talking like that? Ain't you supposed to turn the other cheek? When I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake, keep it in context. Understand your Bible. He didn't say because somebody trying to come in and kill you and rob you. That ain't supposed to, when you're supposed to turn the other cheek. You're supposed to turn the other cheek. Remember, that started when Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed when you're persecuted and, and all manner of evil is said against you for righteousness sake, for my name's sake. And then the rest of the sermon continues on. And then it, it down in the middle of the sermon, it talks about turning the other cheek. But that's just, so, so you honor God. Now, if somebody comes and say, I don't like you because you're a Christian, and slaps me, well, then I'm going to turn around and turn the other cheek. But they say, I don't like you because you're black. Well, when they slap, it ain't going to be a slap back. We're cleaning the yard. All right, everybody understand that. you got to learn what the Bible says and what the Bible means. I didn't tell you to take that. There was a time when Jesus said, okay, now y'all take your swords. When they were getting ready to take him on into to do that illegal trial. All right, all right, here we go. But we, so we got to stand in authority. We got to stand in that exousia and declare the word of God in the enemy's face, which in turn secures him <coughs> in his rightful place. Where's that rightful place? Where's the enemy supposed to be? Under our feet. I've been given authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. I exercise that exousia. I need to look down on the sole of my shoe and see Satan frowning every day. <clears throat> I don't know. I saw in Psalm 91 where it said the, the young lion and the cobra, we trample underfoot. So where's the enemy supposed to be? Every time we speak the word in the face of the enemy, it secures that place. It keeps him hostage. <clears throat> It keeps him chained in that rightful place where he's supposed to be, under our feet and as our footstool. <coughs> it reminds him of his certain fate, which cannot be reversed. His destiny is already there. That's what the Bible means in Jude when he says that they have been kept 
and, and ever, everlasting chains of darkness. It doesn't mean all the, you know, some of the demons are on earth wreaking havoc and some are chained up somewhere. They are in, listen to the description of the chains, everlasting chains of darkness. In other words, Satan's fall and the angels that fell with him cannot be reversed. It's an everlasting death now. When it's all said and done and Jesus puts them away, the Lord puts them away at the end, they, they don't have a salvation. So it's, they're already in everlasting chains of darkness. <coughs> Again, that's a way to keep people of God defeated by making them think, well, demons, I heard a pastor say one time, there ain't no demons running around on earth at all because they're in everlasting chains of darkness. What the heck is going on here? We just. Everlasting chains of darkness means their fate is sealed. <clears throat> no human right now is under everlasting chains of darkness unless they come to reprobate mind. That means that they are hooked to darkness forever already. But they have a time to do what they want to do, to do their bidding on earth. We have to stand up and enforce the power that God has given us by using our exousia to enforce our dunamis. <coughs> All right, that, check that one off. Tradition that we've been taught that wasn't scriptural. All the de demons are not bound yet. The Bible talks about a time that they will be. So we got to understand the expression that Jude was using. How confident can we be in what we have heard so far? Well, let's move on to verse 3 through 6 of Psalm 91. <clears throat> verse 3, a fowler is a snare or trapper. Y'all see that verse 3? What's verse 3 say? Let me get, let me get to it because I want to repeat the verse. We're almost done, y'all. Hang in there. <clears throat> Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. A fowler is a snarer, a snarer, or a trapper. Okay, let's 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 do this. They tried to trap Jesus a lot of times with their words. When they brought the woman out of that, you know, was caught the act of committing adultery. First, they just bring her and not bring the man. That's always a problem. But I don't want that to be the debate. That people see in that. If that's what you see, I mean, that's what you see. It, it let it let it still remain there because it is an issue. The greater thing is, if they caught her in the act of adultery and they wanted to trap Jesus and be mean to Jesus and have and cause him problems, do you think they waited till she put her clothes on? They're the Pharisees, and they want to trap the Savior. They want to trap the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They stood back and said, woman, get up. Now, go over there and put your clothes on for a minute. We got something to do with you. No, we're not going to look. No, they snatched her right up off of that bed because they were wicked and brought her right out into the street, butt ball naked, and slammed her right out in front of Jesus. You know this was true by the next thing that is said about Jesus. What did he do with his eyes? Looked right at the ground. He was still in human flesh. And human flesh of a man, seeing that which God made for man to be able to desire, can cause things to happen when the man sees her in that condition. So his compassion, but yet the, the, the opportunity to say, okay, I'm not going to let them have an advantage on me any kind of way. I'm going to look to the ground. Mm -hmm. And they began to talk to her. Jesus didn't look at her until they had all disappeared. And he said, where are your accusers? Okay. That was a trap. And there's other places where we see in the scripture. So here, here's where we're saved by God. And we're taught wisdom like things like this. Joseph saw a naked woman in the Old Testament. He took off and ran. I don't know if she was naked at that time. All I know is she was trying to get him to, you know, do the hokey pokey and turn herself around. <laughs> Joseph, he got on the horse, man. He took off. Say it's a snare of the fowler or a trapper. 
And the perilous or noisome pestilence is a relentless dreaded disease or plague. Well, I guess this, this, this sickness was sent to me by the Lord so he could teach me something. Jesus is the balm of Gilead. He's the one that the Bible says that talks about the Lord who has forgiven you of all your iniquities and healed you of all your diseases, yet we, we, we blame God instead of putting the blame where it just needs to be. It's just a sinful world. He was created perfectly for us, and man failed. And transgression and sin in the garden caused this to happen. So, so, so he will... He will Deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. So perilous pestilence can hit us, right? But then it, he heals us because if we can't get sick, now that we go, we got Christians that go to the other extreme. I ain't sick. Doctor told you, man, you had stage three cancer. You had stage three lung cancer. I don't know who you talking to. I ain't sick. Well, what you go to the doctor for? I ain't sick. But then God can't be Jehovah Rapha. He can't be your healer. Because there's got to be something to heal. So you can never stand up and sing that Jesus is a healer. You can never declare that because you never declare you're sick so he can go ahead and be who he's supposed to be as the healer. Okay, I served many years of my life as a mechanic. I hear a noise coming out your car. Hey, man, hey, you might want to get that check out. You hear how loud that tapping is? Child, the Lord got me. Man, ain't nothing wrong with my car. Y'all take off from the light, and all of a sudden you see smoke pouring out, and they pulling over. You think you might want me to check out your car? Your car is sick. You need the doctor. But if you declare it ain't nothing wrong, okay, all right. Y'all see the foolishness? And we have that in Christendom. So the perilous pestilence is considered relentless, dreaded disease and plague. I mean relentless, dreaded disease and plague. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy, but I'm reminded that Jesus took a man with a withered hand and took that hand and healed it, and it was made as whole as the other. I don't know. I'm just reminded that there was a Lord there that that, that healed people of leprosy and 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 paralysis. I don't know. I'm reminded that my mother, 76 years old, and she went to a coma of of a, of a diabetic coma with a, a blood sugar count of 17, 16, 1700. We're supposed to lose all the functions of her vital organs. Every one of them functioning normal. Probably more normal than mine. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is true. Come and get you some. All right, all right. But we go that go get that prescription bottle from that doctor. We pop them pills every four hours, as noted. And God said right here in his word. <laughs> And we won't follow those instructions for anything. I, 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 you know, I'm just. <sighs> feathers and wings. Feathers and wings. We already talked about the feathers and the wings. All right. All right. So here it is. Here it is. Here's how protected we are under his wings. We're looking at, at verse four. You shall cover. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings. You shall take refuge. Does anybody know what a, what a bird, especially a bird of prey or bird of valor does to protect their, 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 their little ones? Right. You know, even the little birds, they'll put, their, they'll put those little bitties up under their wings, chickens and all that. They keep them warm. They keep them protected from the elements, from enemies. They hide them from predators. Prayerfully, if something comes up to attack, they'll only take the mother. She'll sacrifice herself, covering her young with her wings, just so she'll die and they'll continue. I'm reminded of somebody that did that for me. So, 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 out in the western part of the country, I think it was Northern California, years and years ago, there was a forest fire. And as they're walking through the smoke, I mean, the fire just destroyed the forest. You know, beautiful forest land up there. If you've ever been up northern part of California, it's just, it's, it's, up, it's just, whew. and we can get the leftists out of there, man. I'll go back to California and enjoy the trip, but I don't know if I want to go over there while they're over there doing what they do. Because, but this land does belong to my father, so if I want to go, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go in authority. All right? So, you know, I just don't want to have to spend my vacation fighting nuts, the, the, the lunatics, the whole time I'm there. And as the firefighters were walking through the forest and seeing the smoldering 
you know, ash, and, and there was something that wasn't quite as tall as a tree, three or four foot high. But as he gets closer, it's charred, it's burnt. And he looks at his, what is that? And so he takes his poker, because, you know, they got the pokers to try to make certain that they can, can make sure all, the, all the, uh, the, the, the burning ash and the coal or fire or whatever, the cinders are out. And he pokes at it, and as he pokes it, it falls over, but falls apart as it's falling over. And out came baby eaglets from under the charred figure of the burned-up mother who put her biddies under her wings to protect them from the fire. She gave her life, but under her wings, they took refuge and she protected them. And here you have those babies able to live and come to a full life just as their mother once had. That is what this verse is talking about. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Now let's think about this truth. John 17 and 17 has something to say about this truth. His truth shall be our shield and our buckler. John 17 and 17 reads like this. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Again, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus the Son praying to God the Father. God the Son praying to God the Father. Verse 5, we can go ahead and verse 5. Verse 5 is going to give us a little bit of something here. A terrorist instills fear into its victims. So what is it talking about? A terror, the terror by what? Terror by night? You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. So a terrorist instills fear into its victims and uses the night as its cloak of sabotage to enhance the fear. How many of us are afraid during the day most of the time? But you're walking around somewhere in the dark. You're the only one you think is out there, and then you hear somebody step on a branch. <laughs> Y'all can tell I used to watch a lot of movies back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't realize it was your foot that did it. <laughs> Man, because fear did exactly what it was supposed to do. And then anything else that wants to can overtake you. And most of the time is generated from our own minds. All right, all right. And it's dark, man. You can't see. You didn't realize that was your foot on the branch. An arrow is shot. And it will hit whatever it is pointed at swiftly. And flying by day means that it doesn't mind being seen attacking its prey. You shall not be afraid of the arrow, right? Nor the arrow that flies by day. It doesn't mind being seen. If you can catch up with it, you might be able to see it, but you might not even see it if it's flying fast enough. It also lets us know that these arrows are exposed. Arrows are the same as destructive words and even tempting thoughts. In Ephesians 6, 16, the fiery darts or arrows are under the rule of the Roman, uh, excuse me, these arrows, excuse me, uh, Ephesians 6, 16, the fiery darts are arrows of Satan uh, are being quenched by the shield of faith from Ephesians 6, 16. We're to use that. And it quenches the fiery darts, it says. This is understood very well by the Ephesians who lived under the rule of Roman military who carried shields that were made of leather and treated with a fire-retardant, flame-quenching oil. So when you see the Romans on television and they're trying to depict the time of Christ or the time of the apostles and you see their shields, their shields weren't just metal. Okay? They also had, they were also covered, bound in a leather coat covering that had a coating of a flame retardant oil. Okay? So when they shot you, because flaming arrows was a, 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 a normal thing to use. They wanted to burn down your fort. Most things, a lot of things were made out of wood. They wanted to burn you up if it hit your clothing. Right? But when they hit that shield, it stick in there and just shh, go right out. All right? That's history. You can, if you study the Roman, the Roman military, you'll see that. I'm not, you know, 
not making that up. Psalm 18 and 30 says this. Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect, and the word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Therefore, there is absolutely no need in being afraid by the arrows sent out to strike you. All right, here we go. Verse 6 says, the pestilence here, as well as verse 3, is in reference to a dreaded disease or dreaded diseases, plagues, and epidemics. These dreaded sicknesses walk. Did you notice that they walk? They walk, always lurking, prowling, and stalking prematurely on the move, seeking whom they may devour. Anybody remember the, the bio disease attack upon the world here just recently? But we're still here. <laughs> Darkness represents their evil disposition, letting us know that they will dwell in that kingdom that houses Satan and his crew. The good news here is that there is no escape for these pestilences, for their fate is sealed and their doom is certain. Just read with me in Jude 6 through 7. I'm going to go to the back of the Bible. We're almost done, y'all. Be patient with me. Please, please, please. Health to your flesh. The strength to your bones right here. Jude 6, verse 6 and 7 says this. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. I like that use of that word, under darkness. So they're not even, so that just lets you know right there they're not there. They're under the, the connection of darkness forever. Already. As Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and going after strange flesh, are set forth in his example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I'm not going to explain those any more in depth. So the darkness in which every evil thing walks is also the eternal prison in which it will remain. Yet we are the children of the light and are told by the Lord that we are, we the light, we are the light of the world being sent forth into darkness as a light, walking in the light to lead others out of the peril of darkness. Everybody understand that? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he looked at his disciples and said, you are the light of the world. And he's going to send us out to be a conduit of his power and a reflection of his glory and of his light upon mankind. The destruction represents sudden death, which seems to program its attack at the peak hour or pinnacle of our lives. It is those vibrant and youthful times that we need to see destruction blow into a person's life, and we ask why. They were so young and full of life, but Jesus told us in John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Eternal life is granted right now when we believe. There's no temporary life. and You lose your salvation. You got to get it back. And then you lose it again. And then you got to get it back. I was told everlasting life. I don't know what part of everlasting has an ending point. I mean, that's just plain English. I don't know why people grapple with their salvation being eternal. You call it once saved, always saved, eternal security, and so on and so on. I heard an evangelist talking last night on a video on television, and he was preaching on the back of one of the trucks during the trucker's convoy going down in Texas. Wonderful. I'm glad you want to stand up and preach the word of God. There's a big cross on the trailer, and people by the hundreds were standing there to listen. But when he said, all of a sudden he started saying, well, once saved, always saved is just a big lie. And I go, where do you get that from? What part of, do you not understand that the Greek word, I will never leave you nor forsake you, or you shall never perish? Do you understand that that Greek word is the, that Greek word for never is the strongest negative in all languages around the world of all time? What part of eternal ceases? You receive eternal life now. You are now on your journey to eternal life, like those... Those, those, those angels that left their proper abode are in everlasting chains of darkness right now. Oh, well, it's easy to say that they are right now, but it's not so easy for us who have believed some kind of false Arminianism doctrine that says you can lose your salvation. That's Arminianism. Go check it out. 
Any of y'all ever watch them girls where they, what, what's them girls' names on TV? The Kardashians, they're Armenians. So go talk to them and see what their, their country really believes when they read the Bible and how they interpret that. That just comes from one little small sect of people in the entire globe. And that doctrine is spread around the world now to make Christians believe they can lose their salvation. You cannot lose your salvation when you're saved. God already knows the end from the beginning. So why would he waste the precious blood of Jesus to save you only to say, well, I know he's going to, you know, going to fall out. <laughs> when he says no one can pluck you out of my hand, that included you too. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You got more power than everybody else. Nobody else can pluck you out of God's hand. Even the devil himself with his dunamis can't pluck you out, but you can pluck yourself out. Well, you can save yourself. So how do you have the power to unsave you? He defeated sin, so how are you committing an act of sin going to un... No, 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 no. You're his child now. What you're going to get is some discipline. <laughs> My mom and daddy didn't thought, oh, you're out of the family. I've been locked up before. My parents didn't forsake me because I went to jail. You know you got what you deserve, don't you? You better be glad they got you first. That's what I got. You better hope I'm calmed down by the time you get out of here. Or you're going to get some more. They didn't say, sorry, you're no longer a part of our family. Why? My daddy's DNA still running through my veins. I'm sorry, the blood of Jesus rescued me. All right. <coughs> Go to the book of Hebrews and read about the discipline of God in Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> he does those things that it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. He's not a man that he just gives up on his children. He's not a deadbeat dad, but he's a faithful father. All right. I know I'm busting a lot of myths in here today, but God's got you covered. Stop being fearful of the ideologies and philosophies and doctrines of demons that come our way. He gave his son. He sacrificed his own, his only begotten son, that when you believe on him, you shall not perish but have temporary life until you working my nerves. All right, let's go. All right, we're at the end, y'all. <laughs> my question today to you is this. <coughs> Do you believe this? See, I'm secure in God. I, I know it. I, I, listen, you're talking to, I don't know if there's anybody in this room that's as screwed up as bad as I have in my life. If you have, you just say, let me know. And that's okay. It's between you and the Lord. But I'm here to let you know. He disciplines you, and he brings you right back. I had messed up so bad, I said, there's no way, Lord, I can go be a pastor and teach your people the word. Uh, he said, yes, you will. He said, I called you. I didn't call the man next to you. If I called you to it, that means I've already invested in it. You're going to do it. Now, you're going to either go, 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 go willingly now, or you can keep kicking and screaming. And I got something else for you. <clears throat> How many of us keep working on our old cars to keep them running? Or did we just give up the first time the car broke down? It may be second or third time the car broke down. How many of us gave up on that old TV the first time it broke? Or the radio? <laughs> no, we just keep working on it. How many of us get, get that stuff sent to us on you by UPS in the mail from somebody? And we got to go ahead and fix it because they ain't giving up on that old broken down RCA, that old Zenith. <laughs> That old floor console, hey, man, that TV carried me and my family for 45 years. You, you, you can fix it. My man over there, I bet he got tubes sitting in the back of the shop right now because somebody just won't let go of that console television with the stereo built into it and the big uh, um, Serban Vega speaker sitting up in the front of it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Then God's not going to give up on us so easy. He never will. He's a faithful father. When he said he saved us and gave us eternal life, then that's what he did. All right. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, just as Martha answered him when she said this. When we answer in this manner, we are proclaiming that Jesus is God and we are confessing life. Therefore, death, the grave and hell has no power over us. 
Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? In fact, Jesus said that the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. Jesus is in control of the gates, even of hell. And Jesus has all authority, has given all authority to us. We've already gone over that several times. Have you confessed with your mouth? Have we confessed with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in our heart that God has raised him from the dead? If not, are you able to do that now? <clears throat> this will be your war cry against all darkness and the place in the secret place under God's grace, under God's shadow, under God's feathers and wings. His protection, he's got you. Even when you fail, remember, he's got you. All things work together for the good. I don't mean go out here and go crazy and act a fool to sin. For where, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. But Paul said, so does this mean we should go and sin even the more? He said, certainly not. Do not tempt the Lord your God. But when we fail in our daily walk of life, at whatever point that we fail, God is there to rescue us. I never saw a father. Now, there are probably some. But I never saw a mother or a father kick their son when they were down because they fell off the bicycle. I saw my family support me in the worst of my days. Not that they supported my failure, but they supported me as a person to help me recover and to be resilient and to come back from what could have been a demise in my life. Father, we want to thank you for this day, for this time, this hour. If there were any that were listening to this message today that does not know Jesus in the part of their sins, Father, we pray and ask that you will touch their hearts by your spirit. Draw them to the foot of the cross. Jesus says, no man come unto me unless the Father draw him. And that word draw there in the Greek is the word drag. So, Father, we ask that you drag somebody that heard your word today that desires to have what we were talking about but do not know Jesus Christ and yet, therefore, don't understand what this is all about. We pray that you will cause them to confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their hearts that God raised them from the dead that they will be saved. Because you, Father, sent your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You did not send your son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thank you, Father, for that precious and priceless gift, Jesus Christ. And now he dwells in earthen vessels of those who believe. What a beautiful, glorifying life to live. What a secure life. What a comforting life to live to know that you are with us always, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> you got us covered. We don't have to fear any evil. Why? Because you are with us. Today, Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Father, for the gifts, monetary money, uh, gifts of clothing, food, any items that are given to this ministry, books and resources that you give to us, Father. We pray and ask that you will Help us to be good stewards over that which you have entrusted to us. Help us fulfill your calling through those things that have been given to us, not only to the body of believers that are here, but to the people of the community of New Bern, North Carolina. We thank you, Father. We love you for your grace is amazing and sufficient for all things that we need. Again, we thank you. and We thank you for loving us. And we love you. Amen. We'll have our announcements from our administrative assistant, Nadine. Testing. Hey there, everyone. Very, very quickly, uh, just a few <coughs> reminders. Our Sunday morning worship celebration is the first through fourth Sundays at 1030, and our expiration through the scripture is the first through fourth Wednesdays at 7 p.m. A couple of announcements. We have... Small groups this Thursday, last Thursday were the men, was the men. This Thursday at 7 p.m. is Daughters of Sarah. It's for us ladies. Woohoo, right? Come on now. I don't hear the noises like I heard with the men last week. There you go. There you go. Got to keep up. Got to keep up. 
We do have our prayer night the fourth Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. If you can, please come to that. That would be February 27th. That is a wonderful hour. We try to keep it to an hour of intense prayer, and things do happen. We have a number of victories that we have celebrated because of that prayer night. Mm -hmm. We have a movie night coming up February 17th at 5 p.m. will be the start time approximately. If you can make that, please do so. A couple of community announcements. Monday. February the 19th at Moore's Barbecue is the God and Country Christian Alliance. Please come check that out at 7 p.m. And then the next day, Tuesday the 20th, is the Coastal Carolina Taxpayers Association at the Stanley Ballroom. This month we have the presentation of the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Sons of the American Revolution. So if you can, please check that out. Uh, also, check out our Facebook page. If you haven't already checked it out, do so. Hit the like button. Subscribe to it. We have notifications and updates of our weekly schedule there as well as photos. We just uploaded a whole bunch of photos this, from this past weekend's event, so check that out. If you would like to give to the Lord through this ministry, envelopes and collection containers are available to my right on the table to the right. You also can do a cash app, which is the dollar sign, all capital letters, NB Celebration number one. Or if you'd like to mail in a donation, question, comment, concern, whatever it may be, you can write to us at P.O. Box 13164, Newbird, N.C. 28561. As always, thank you for choosing New Beginnings Celebration to feed on the Word of God. You are important to us, you are somebody, and you are most definitely loved. So please, for those here, stick around. We'll have refreshments and fellowship afterwards. Pastor. Wonderful. Thank you for the announcements. Thank you all for being here with us today in person. And I want to thank you for taking the time out while you're sitting in your leisure time to just click in and see what it is this babbler has to say. I pray that it was beneficial to your life, that it's life-changing, life-altering, and then that you will take it and share it with someone else. Uh, don't forget to like and to subscribe to on the videos. And again, we hope that you can come down here to 3400 Trent Road, Suite D, New Bern, North Carolina, 1030 a.m. Sundays, 730 p.m. on Wednesdays. We love you. We love the Lord. And we hope that you will have.